reply. <laughs> well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Because I should turn this on, huh? Well, hey, it's a wonderful day. Just a beautiful day outside. Uh, we went to Iron Sharpens Iron's Men Conference yesterday, and it was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Uh, the nice thing is, is, is like uh, Pastor Terry and I, as pastors, we get to go there, and yet we don't have to do anything <laughs> except be there and soak it all in, get renewed, get refreshed. And I got to tell you, that, that was awesome. I heard some of the best talks ever. Uh, yesterday and uh, it is really really a good way for you to get renewed in the spirit and so I thank God that he makes these available to us um, so the church that hosted Corndale Church down in Davenport uh, they hosted it for the last 10 years so they will be finding a new venue now for next year and hopefully uh, have a long-term relationship with that church as well uh, so uh, Iron Sharpens Iron isn't going away, it's just changing venues for next year. So if you're able to go, it is absolutely awesome and very, very worthwhile. So uh, we had a great time. Uh, so good morning everybody. If you're online this morning, we welcome you uh, for joining us and please let us know in the notes column in there that you're watching us so that we can uh, bless you as well. So uh, this week we've got our continuing series on the seven words in our sermon series. So we're going to dive deep into Woman, Where Is Your Son? which is the topic of today's sermon today. So we'll do a deep dive Wednesday at 7 p.m. So make sure you come in here. We have a lot of good discussion, I think, and a lot of good points that make you go, oh, yeah, that's what that's about. Uh, and I love those kind of awakening times where the light bulb turns on and you finally understand that scripture that you've heard probably for the last 40 years, well, depending on how old you are, uh, 40 years, maybe 50, 60 years, um, but it finally clicks and you understand it. And God reveals the meaning behind that, the full meaning behind it. And so I, I love it as we do these studies in here and as all of these <coughs> mysteries are revealed. Season 19 of Orange Track Racing is coming up. Uh, this uh, Saturday the 9th of March and uh, we had a really good turnout this last time around we had some new people coming in <coughs> and so that's always fun because we have to jockey real quick and tell them how to race and what to do and how to do it and get them all signed up for it but it's always nice to see new people uh, coming and joining us in for that as well and seeing how we are going to be having uh, springing forward next week, we get to lose an hour of sleep, unfortunately. Do not forget to set your clocks ahead one hour. Spring forward, fall behind. Uh, I always like the fall part. I guess it's just me. But we got to meet, remember to spring our, head, our clocks ahead forward next week and uh, so that we can be here to worship together and have us bright, sunny, shining faces all together again. In addition to that, then, coming up March 16th at 6 p.m., we're going to have the movie Finding Normal. And, and as we've uh, talked about here in the past, it's a movie about a doctor, a very accomplished doctor who's moving all the way across this country to start up her own practice with her then fiancé. And uh, she runs into a little bit of trouble with the law, uh, getting into normal North Carolina. And so they sent her to do some community service time. Uh, and so it is really a completely rock your world type of experience for her. And so uh, it it's, turns into be a very good movie, an awakening for her with God in the process. And it's fantastic. So uh, as we go through and we have our curated music and everything at the end of the service here for you online, uh, link for the music today will be in the uh, notes column so make sure you click on that and uh, it always we always try and curate the music so it ties into the message and gives you a more full understanding of what we were talking about in the message today I'm wakeful for Pastor Perry to come back in this wind outside the decided it was going to take our sign so we have to put it back up I guess he's putting it inside that's why so as we begin our time of worship this morning, let's go to God in prayer. 
gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you that this is the day that you have made. And we should be rejoicing and understanding the blessing of waking up to another day in your presence today. As your word tells it, that we will rejoice and be glad in this day, each and every day. So Lord, let us call out to you each day and just rejoice that your presence is with us and that our presence is with you. So Father God, we thank you for that. We ask that you would open our hearts today to hear the message in no matter what form it comes to you, that we open our hearts and receive that message in so that we can live it out each and every day. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry today as he gives the message and that we will be fully involved with the message that is in your seven words that we're learning about in our Lenten studies here. Woman, where is your son? So thank you, Lord, that you have given us these opportunities to gather here together freely and openly to learn more, to begin our closer relationship with you, and to draw closer to you in everything we say and everything we do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. So this morning, I can only stand so long. Oh, that's better. Uh, our call to worship this morning that Pastor Terry is, has uh, um, chosen is from Matthew 12, 48 through 50. And it comes from the time when Jesus is on the cross and he's, he's hanging on the cross and he is going through all of the excruciating torture that he's going through. And he calls out and he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he pointed to his disciples and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So that should tell us something right away is, as Jesus was on the cross and as he was making the way for us to have it restored relationship with God that we lost in the fall of the Garden of Eden. He is restoring that relationship and furthermore he is inviting us to be a member of the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ which is who we are as the church. The body of the Christ is the brothers and sisters and mothers of Christ. So God is calling us back into the relationship as Jesus is calling out these words from the cross, he's inviting us to come in to that right relationship, that righteousness that was talked about through the scriptures. And so we, we have Jesus who is there. He is calling out to God. He is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, it's a familial relationship that he has. Jesus followed his own teaching and what he's saying here, being willing to forsake earthly family for a heavenly family. And in doing so, he says, okay, these are my biological family, but you, you now are restored into a heavenly family with God as the Father. He created a new family of persons who were obedient to God. He called it the church, the people of God. And see, as the people of God, they obey God. That's what we are called to do. Serving Christ and belonging to that fellowship of faith that transcends any physical relationships that you have. So you may have a bad relationship with your family, with your parents. Maybe you didn't have a good upcoming, but guess what? By Jesus telling this us this on the cross, he is inviting us into a family to where we won't worry about that because we will have a perfect relationship with a perfect God in union with those who obey Christ. You see, that physical birth makes you a blood relative of those around you in your family. It is something you have to commit yourself to instead to be a child of God. You cannot inherit the faith of your family. You have to commit to it yourself in having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that, the, that becomes then the family of God, that relationship. 
See, in that relationship, then, Christ creates a new family through obedience to the Word of God. Now, the only way we can know the Word of God is to study the Word of God and to be in communion with each other. And Don and I were talking about being in communion today, and I posted something up on, on Facebook about that today that our life is made up of a batch of choices that we made. And you can choose to stay at home in church. And Dr. Jeremiah, uh, as I was listening to him this morning, said that there was a study that came out that said, even as good Christians, they only attend church two out of every five weeks on the average in today's society. Now, he also went on to say, and as the scriptures tell us, there's consequences for everything that we do. And you'll have to answer for that. You'll have to answer for, oh, gee, I just didn't want to get out of bed today. I just didn't want to go to church today. But see, God is calling us into that communion to be together so that we can lift each other up, so that we can have our talents, our gifts that we are given through the Holy Spirit. We're each given different gifts that complement each other. And unless we get together in communion with each other, then we don't get the full benefit that God intends to give us through those gifts of the Spirit. So we need to have that communion time that gather together in the presence of God. A family of Christians that serve Christ in the process. Disobeying shows that uh, if you're disobeying Christ, then it shows that you're in opposition to Christ and what he's telling us. You know better than what he does. And see, the thing about it is with the scriptures in there, it says there's no middle ground. In the immortal words of Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. Either you are in Christ and with Christ, or you're without Christ and you're against him. And he knows that through our faith, and through our actions, through the relationships that we have, that's how he knows us and will recognize us when we become our time to be in front of judgment because we all are going to have to face judgment at one time or another. And either Christ is going to come up and he's going to intervene in front of us and say, you know, he is a faithful child of God. Or he's going to say, go away, I don't know you. Go and serve the one you served while back on earth. And those are our choices, do or do not. There is no try. You can't try to be a Christian. You have to commit to be one. So go and serve the one that you serve while back on earth. If it's Christ, you're in good, good grace. If not, I hope you love he. I hope you love he. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we ask that you would open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. And Lord, help us to understand the blessings that you have for us each and every day. Help us to understand the words that come to us through the message that Pastor Terry is going to give us this morning. Through the words and the music that he has curated for us to hear today, another set of messages to help bring us closer into relationship, to help us understand your will for us in, your, in our lives and here and in your world to be. Lord, help us to prepare the path for eternal life in you. Help us to accept that path and not be led astray by this world. So we praise you and thank you in these things, and we ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless us each and every day in your word, in your deed. Help us to be in a closer relationship with you in everything we say and everything precious name.
what Mary must have been thinking. If we go all the way back to the beginning, her immense joy at finding out that she was going to have a child. If you're a parent, you can relate. I remember the immense joy of when my daughters were born. And from birth to first words, first steps, and then you blink. And they're all growing up. Mm -hmm. And they got their own kids. Mm -hmm. And now you've got more immense joy. Mm -hmm. I love how God just continues <laughs> to stack that joy upon joy. But along that way, we have more ups and downs than we can count. Sometimes more downs than we have ups. It just depends. But all along that path, all along this journey, we pray that nothing bad ever happens to them. We celebrate victories with them. How excited do we get when they come home and they are excited because uh, they got a good grade, or maybe they won a race, or they hit a home run, or whatever it was, we rejoice in those victories with them. And then there's everything that's in between. In a sermon a while back, we talked about what happens in the dash. Birth, death, dash. And that's all of that that's going on. And as they're growing up, Guess what? You're growing up too. <laughs> still growing. I'm still growing up. I'm, I'm, you know, Jeffrey. I'm a Toys R Us kid. I don't want to grow up that thing. <laughs> Diane still gets on my case because I like to get inside the yard and jump up and down on the yard ways to pack it down, jump out, put more in. She keeps telling me I'm old. I keep denying it. But at some point along the way, as we're growing up, a light bulb goes off, if you will. And we remember what we put our parents through. We remember the things of our youth. And I know that since my parents have left this earthly world, that a lot of those memories come up a lot quicker and a lot more often. Especially as you're trying to go through a tub of stuff that was theirs and going, do I really need to keep that for anything? Will the kids want that? Or am I just going to store it and not look at it for a few years? But the thing is, is at some point we go from being taken care of to taking care of to then taking care of our parents. So we go from being the taken care of by our parents to having our own kids going through what our parents did and then turning around and caring for our parents. And just as we have always wanted for our children, we want the same thing for our parents. We want their and their latter years to be wonderful and full of life. We want the best for them. Then we get a curveball like we did four years ago. Can you believe it's been four years since the global pandemic hit? Families were separated. Fathers could not be in the same room as their wives while their children were being born. People were not allowed to be with their loved ones. People in the hospital were dying alone. A lot of our family visits to Diane's mom were through a window. And because she can't see very well or hear very well, that was really difficult. You had to do it over the phone. It was a difficult time. In that same vein, I started working from home at that time, and I still do to this very day. And it's in these circumstances, in these are times of being alone, that we can look back at last week's message that Mark gave us, because in those moments we felt forsaken or abandoned. There's no one around. I still don't like working from home. I mean, it's nice, the 20-second walk downstairs, but there's nobody around. 
and it's lonely. And I don't necessarily feel so much forsaken, it's just a little bit of an abandonment issue. Yeah, you get to talk to people all day long, but it's not the same as having that face-to-face -face interaction. And last week's scripture, Mark read, Jesus asked the Father the very question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some translations do use the word abandoned instead. But what about Jesus' mom? She was there with him. Did she feel forsaken? Did she feel abandoned? Did she feel confused? The beauty of it is, is Jesus knew how she felt. And in today's scripture, we learn how he would go on to take care of her. Even in her despair, physically, Mary was not alone. Turning to John 19, verse 25. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. There's four ladies there. Now, punctuation is important, because I can remember reading this years ago, thinking it was three people. Jesus' mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, which I always wondered why Mary had a sister named Mary. I blew past the punctuation. Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there, beside this disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, we live in an, in an age of entertainment. So in my mind, I just view a scene. I see, you've got Jesus hanging on the cross. You've got the two uh, thieves on either side of the criminals. You've got these people milling around, yelling things at him. You've got the soldiers. All this noise. Maybe a little wind blowing. But cinematically, I see all of this get shrunk to just showing Jesus and Mary and the people immediately around her. Everything else is muted out. So you get all this noise and all of a sudden it's muted. And the people around them, they're maybe blurred out so that you don't pay attention so much then. That focus is on Jesus and his mom. That the humane, inhumane, barbaric scene becomes softened as Jesus sees his mother. And then his words ring out, Dear woman, here is your son. And then turning to John, or as the scripture says, turning to his disciple, here is your mother. And then just as quickly as we got zoomed in and everything got blurred out and quieted down, it goes back to the normal scene. And all that noise and everything else comes back into focus. But Jesus, and what brought me to that is that Jesus, in this moment, he puts everything else aside and he focuses on his mother. And with by entrusting Mary to John's care, we can presume Joseph has already died because Mary would be a widow if he is entrusting her to someone else's care. Now, he's the oldest son, and with Joseph already gone, it was up to him to take care of his mother, and up to this point he had. But this is why he needed to pass her care on to someone else. He knew his time was very near to the end. So immediately the question comes to mind, why John? Didn't Jesus have brothers? Isn't there other family he could have presented her to? Mary's other sons, Jesus' brothers, or half-brothers, if you will, they hadn't put his faith, their faith in him yet. They did not recognize him as the Messiah. 
In fact, it's not even recorded that they were even there. And since they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, by entrusting her to one of them could have caused complications for their faith, eventual faith in him, and for Mary's. Now, the others were still there. This is strictly focused on Mary. Each of them knew what the outcome was. His mother knew. His aunt knew. Mary, the wife of Clopas, knew. Mary Magdalene knew. John knew he was going to die. They had probably witnessed a crucifixion in the past. They knew he was going to die. And they knew the outcome, but only from an earthly perspective at this point. They'd heard the words, just like when we're young Christians or early Christians in our life, in our faith walk, we hear the words, but they don't always ring to the true meaning. It's kind of like getting milk at first and then being weaned to uh, regular food. They watched they waited. I can't even imagine what they might have felt as Jesus was in his agony, watching him slowly suffocate and die. Many of you may have personally experienced the death of a loved one. You may have been with a loved one as they passed. And all you can do is sit there and be with them and just share your love and concern, your compassion. And your Ultimately, by being there, you're showing your commitment. By being there at the cross, John and those four women showed their unwavering commitment, their unwavering love, their unwavering concern for Jesus. And it was because of this unwavering commitment that Jesus knew that he could trust this disciple to faithfully care for his mother. These 12 disciples had become like family. John was like family. Now all of us have those people in our lives that are like family. How many of you had that mom or, or dad, a, maybe a friend's mom or dad or a neighborhood family that was like mom or dad? It was always the mom that made the cookies. And... Well, growing up, my brother and I, we had Hazel and Lottie. They were our next door neighbors. My mom's parents had passed at this point and they became like parents to her, like a surrogate family for her. And for my brother Doug and I, they were like grandma and grandpa Mork. My mom was, they called her the cookie lady, but I always got her cookies. I could go over to Hazel's and I could get cookies. So this is a type of family where it's not always about a blood relationship. As a church family, we're united by our love for one another. We care about each other. We're committed to helping one another. We're committed to praying for each other, to being there for one another. Some families, well, they're not able to have their own children. We have an adopted nephew. He's just as much a part of our family as someone who is a blood. We choose to make him part of the family. We adopted him into the family. So that raises the question, who is the true family of Christ? Who is Jesus' true family? For that, we can go back to Jesus' teachings. 
Now this morning for the call to worship, Mark read from Matthew 12. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 3, verses 31 and 35. Same instance, but listen to these words. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, we can speculate all we want on why they came. We do know that they didn't yet believe that he was the Messiah. So maybe they were just there to try and persuade him to stop what he was doing and go home. Maybe they thought that he had gone just a little crazy and didn't want him to bring any shame to the family. But let's go back to verse 21, just before that, verses 20 and 21 from Mark 3 says, One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. Let's think about that for a second. If a family member suggests you do something, I can attest to this because, you know, she tells me something. I hear it. I don't know, well, we talked about hearing and listening several weeks ago, right? But when a stranger or a, maybe a friend or, or a neighbor or someone else tells you, oh, that sounds like a good idea. We have a tendency to shrug it off when it's that's crazy. It'll never work. You're out of your ever-loving mind. Family. Well, they can be a little more critical. They know you the best. And so when, they say, when it says that he's out of his mind, they're looking at it from a different perspective. Scripture tells us how frustrated Jesus would get with the relig religious leaders. Imagine his frustration with his own family when they would do something like that. The patience he would have needed. Oh wait, the patience he needs with me now today. Honestly, one of the most difficult places to be a witness for Christ is with your own family. They will be the first to misinterpret what you might be saying. Here's one way we can look at Jesus' statement about his mother and brothers. His mother and brothers were related to him by blood. The disciples and we as Christians are connected to Jesus by his blood. Different. Because it's his blood shed for us on the cross. It would only be after the crucifixion that his brothers would come to believe. If we go back to verse 35, we see that Jesus places a priority on anyone who has submitted themselves to God's will. That tells me that our closeness to God is important. This candle, this represents God. Now, if I had everybody come up and stand in a circle around it, right next to one another, I'm not going to make everybody do that. You'd be right next to one another. You'd be very close because you, get, you want to get as close to God as you can. Now, we're right here. What happens when we take a step back? Now we're a little bit further away from God, but what else are we afraid? little further away from. 
other and further away from each other. And the further that we get from God, the further that we get from each other. Our family, our church family. When we let things get between ourselves and God, we start to affect that relationship. If we're not spending time in prayer, if we're not reading scriptures every day, we're getting further away from God. And what happens when we get further away from God? We get closer to the world. And that allows Satan an opportunity. He can put his foot in the door and hold it there while you get further away. And then that door opens further and further. This is why it's so important that we come together each week. And I did not put this in here because it was the name of the conference yesterday. But let's look at Proverbs 27, 17, where it says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And I chose this graphic for a purpose. You see, iron sharpens iron. It's a little bit smaller. The key piece here is, friend sharpens a friend. We were talking on the way here this morning about how when we're not in the Word or we don't have our daily time with God, and, and there's a couple, of them, a couple of you here that get together on a daily basis to read and discuss the Scriptures. You don't feel right. It doesn't feel good. Something's missing. We stay sharp when we're in the Word. So let's go back to our original text from this morning. John 19, 25 and 27. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his other sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And then, from then on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, it's very telling and very interesting that he, John doesn't use Mary's name. Jesus' mother. And Jesus, when he addresses his mother, says woman instead of mother. In our study, and we'll touch on this a little bit more on Wednesday, it's suggested that Mary maybe be compared to Eve. In Genesis 2.23 it says, At last the man exclaimed, This bone is bone from my bone, and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman, because she was taken from man. Isn't it interesting then that John begins his book with the creation story? Just something to think about before Wednesday night. To that same point, can we look at Jesus then as the second Adam? Jesus came to make things right that went wrong with Adam and Eve. He came to bring us back into God's presence. We were removed from God's presence because of our sin. He came back to make us righteous and bring us back into the presence of God. He came to teach us how to live our lives. And in his teaching, Jesus tells us the importance of taking care of the orphans and widows, which, as Mark mentioned a little bit ago, is something that he would personally demonstrate by placing Mary into John's care. And I love the fact that after his brothers come to know him as the Messiah, James writes this. And this is from James 1.27. <clears throat> Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. What Jesus said, what he taught, and what he did all line up. It is because of what Jesus did that we are 
one. We are family. Because we do God's will, we are considered Jesus' family. God's children. Jesus joined us together at the foot of the cross when he said, Dear woman, here's your son, and here's your mother. As a family, we are to care for one another just as the early church did. Acts 4, 32 and 37 says, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that they, or what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. We are brought together. Sometimes we can't, it might not be monetary that we help each other with. Maybe what, all we can provide is encouragement and prayer. But we're giving everything that we have in doing that. In John 17, Jesus prayed that the disciples would be one just as he and the Father These six words are so simple. Dear woman, here is your son. And yet, they are so complete and they reach so far. This is why it is so important to never take Jesus' words lightly. This was not a brush off of the words. John took it and he took Mary home and he cared for her as if she were his own. Heavenly Father, we are your children, but so often we let worldly things come between us. We let our own feelings, our own thoughts, and our own desires get in the way of what is truly important. Help us, Lord, to keep the world from getting between you and each and every one of us. As we get further from you, we also get further from each other. Lord, it is my prayer that we would quit ignoring the promptings of the Holy Spirit that we would quit listening to the world. I pray instead that we would draw closer to you, drawing closer to one another. Make us one, Father. Remind us daily that we are your children. Let us be a light in your world. And let the world see you through us, your children. Give us the courage to follow you and to love and take care of one another. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat>
take communion <clears throat> each time we celebrate the body of Christ which is broken for us. That means that he broke his body down. He took the weight of the sins of the world of all mankind upon him and his body was broken down. And he told the disciples on that night that he was to be betrayed to take the body, take the bread of, of Christ. The body is broken for you. Take and eat. Share in this as restoration. Likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it and after he blessed it, he said, this cup is the new cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. In this, we remember then the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, the washing clean of the blood of Christ, the restoration of our relationship with God from the cross. And from the cross, he said, these are my brothers and sisters through the blood of Christ on the cross. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. for the people. And, um, I just wanted to tell you um, last week when I asked everyone to pray for my uh, daughter's fiance because he was running a fever for like four days, that very night his fever broke and he is feeling much, much better. So thank you all for your prayers. You know, prayer does work. So if there's anyone that would like to ask for prayer, I'd be willing to pray for you. There's anybody? Not, I have a few on the list, so. Okay. <laughs> Father God, we come to you this morning and give glory to your holy name. We thank you for this church, for our ministers, Mark and Terry, who spend their time reaching, researching your word to teach it to us so we can understand the words of the gospel written for us. As Psalms 84, 1, 2, and 10 state, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. We give thanks to all who are called to build up your church and to all who honor you. To you we lift up our souls because by your words we are acquitted of our sins and transgressions healed of our diseases and brokenness. You alone can give us eternal life. Let us glorify your holy name now, for no one knows what the future holds. If we wait, it could be too late to unlock your free gift of forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, for your Bible. It gives us words of wisdom to live by. I invite the Holy Spirit to reign in this church and to all who are online listening as we pray for those in need. Father God, we lift up Dan Britton's family. We pray for his father last Sunday as he was in his final hours. He passed Sunday night. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We thank you for his life. We ask for peace and comfort to be upon this, this family as they face each new day. Help them to feel your presence and to lift them up in their hours of need. Father, I lift up everyone here and online that have been afflicted by the COVID virus or influenza virus. In your, in your word, it states that you heal us from our diseases. Therefore, I ask that you release us from these viruses in Jesus' name. As it says in Psalms 84, 8, Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Father God, I lift up Sarah and Antonin for the loss of their nephew. We don't understand the why, O God, why someone so young is taken from us. But we trust in you, O God, to be there for us in our trials and to heal our hearts and minds. We cast our cares on you. 
Father God, as we listen for your word to restore us, be with them and her, her nephew's family. Help restore their lives as only you can. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for these families. And Father God, I will be persistent in praying to restore our bodies for Mark, Joe, and myself. In Jesus' name, I ask for this restoration quickly. Father, I thank you for this beautiful weather and that our homeless are fed and taken care of on a daily basis. We thank you for their lives, Lord, and give them hope for each new day. We thank you, Father, for our children and grandchildren. May you teach them the way to walk in your love. As in Psalms 86, 11 through 12, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will, I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God. With all my heart, I will glorify your name forever and ever. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. In 1908, John Oxenham wrote a hymn. Silently, in Christ there is no east or west. Here are the words from this hymn. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. In him shall two hearts everywhere their high communion find. His service is the golden rod, close, binding, all mankind. Join hands united in the faith, whate'er your race may be, who serves my Father as their own, are surely kin to me. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet south and north, as Christly souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. Yesterday we heard a statistic about family. 40, 50 years ago, less than 4% of families did not have a father in the home. Today, that is 43 plus percent. I'm sure it's going up off every day. But what if we look at it from a different perspective? See, those numbers have, have flipped. It would have been maybe 4% of homes didn't have the father. Now, 40 plus percent don't have the father in the home. And the, as we talked about earlier, the further we get away from him, the further we get away from one another, the closer we get to the things of this world. Psalm 133 says this, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head and ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. One of the guys yesterday talked about being anointed. Somebody asked him if they could anoint him with oil, and he was thinking, you know, the little drop on, maybe a little cross on the forehead. No, she poured anointing oil on his head, and the first thing he thought of was, oh, I'm wearing a really good shirt. <laughs> That's not the attitude that we need to have. The psalm ends with one more verse, saying, Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion, and there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting, when we come together as the people of God. We get life everlasting. We know where our eternity is. We have that hope. Let's share that with the world. Father, show us how we can share that with the world. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for what you have given to us, what you provide for us. Let us share that. 
Father, I realize that the scriptures tell us that it, as we get closer and closer to the end days, the more or the harder and harder it will be. The further and further people will be from you, Father. But Father, that does not preclude us from praying for a, a repentance and a revival of the people to come back to you one more time. So that that narrow gate can be what we experienced yesterday as we were waiting to go get something to eat. A packed line full of people waiting to see you. Waiting to meet their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, thank you. We give all praise, honor, and glory to you. In Jesus' name.